Time that I swore I would never go back. I was blind to the truth, didn't know what I had. I was running, I was searching, but every place I turned for healing left me more broken than the last. Take me back to the place that feels like home, to the people I can depend on, to the faith that's in my bones. Take me back to a preacher in a verse Where they've seen me at my worst To the love I had at first Oh, I want to go to church Trying to walk on my own but I'm wound up lost Now I'm making my way to the foot of the cross not a trophy for the winners It's a shelter for the sinners And it's right where I belong Take me back To the place that feels like home To the people I can depend on To the faith that's in my bones Take me back To a preacher and a verse Where they've seen me at my worst To the love I had at first Oh, I want to go to church I want to go to church That's in my bones Take me back To a preacher And a verse Where they've seen me at my worst To the love I had at first Oh, I wanna go to church Let me start off by first saying, hey, good morning. It is good to have you all back. Uh, we, we missed you in Mexico. We did. I, I, you know, I watched on, on uh, Facebook, you know, I could, I could watch and see what was going on. And, and uh, poor Mark is up there and I'm texting him. I can't hear this person. They need a mic. Well, it's intentional. I thought, okay, so yeah, so trying to tell me that you're going to do something, and, uh, and so I understood when, as soon as I saw Rick talking, I know what's going on. <laughs> and so, um, so we're watching and everything, and I'm, and I'm sitting there, and I'm texting him, and I'm, I'm telling him, hey, turn this up, turn this one up. You need to turn that one up. I can't hear this one, do you hear that one? And I know I, I was probably bugging him to death, you know, but... It's good when you can kind of sit back and observe sometimes. 
Uh, yeah, but I was in my bed. <laughs> you know, and, and, and I know some of you would love to do that. Well, you can't. I can tell you it's just not the same. It, it really isn't. Uh, because you, you do miss people and everything. And so one of the things that um, I, I don't know if, if you're aware of what's going on, but uh, churches across the nation are shutting down. They're shutting down at, at an alarming um, uh, rate. They, did it, they came out with a study uh, last week, I believe it was, uh, maybe this week, that basically what you are seeing is uh, kids are no longer going to church. Uh, used to, you, you hear this all the time, and most of us went through this, where you heard the old story, uh, I was drugged to church. I was made to go to church all of the time. Every time the church doors was open, we were supposed to be there. And as soon as I turned 18, I'm done. There no longer would somebody tell me that I gotta go to church. I'm on my own and I'll sleep in and I'll do all of that stuff and, and everything and, and, and every, all of those. And then you hear the stories about later on in life, when people hit around their 30s, mid 30s, 40s, they start looking, things, things start changing. Uh, children growing up. And, and then all of a sudden people realizing, you know, um, it really wasn't so bad to be taught when I was a kid growing up. And I really think I need to give my kids some of the same things that, that I had. And so you would see all of a sudden a, a reflection of like a, almost like a tidal wave of people coming back to the church at that period of time. That's no longer happening. What they're seeing now is that when people hit their 40s, instead of coming to church, they just keep going. And part of it is because the church has, to them, become irrelevant. It doesn't function. And, and some of it is our fault as, as churches, because we argue, we, we, we do stupid things. We split over the color of a carpet. We split over music. I was reading an article and this guy wrote that basically, uh, which I don't agree with, who said that uh, the, reason, the reason that church is no longer uh, good is because we no longer have a piano and an organ in the hymnals. And that's what we need to go back to is those things. Uh, look, can I say something, y'all? Um, I don't know about you, but I grew up kind of in a church with a church and a or piano and an organ. And I grew up with the hymnals, and don't get me wrong, I, I still love hymnals and everything. Uh, the difference is the words are on the screen instead of in my hand. So instead of looking, looking down to sing, I can hold my head up to sing. It also gives me my hands free to be able to praise the Lord. Uh, it, it also, um, you know, we're still singing the same thing. But what he was saying was this. Well, the reason it is is because Back then, you had the shape notes. And so, if you, learned, if, if you learned to read shape notes, you could basically go every tune. If you learned how to read the shape notes, it didn't matter what the tune of the song was, if you read those, you would know the tune and you would pick it up real fast. A lot of people would read the shape notes, they would read the things, and they knew that they were supposed to go up, they were supposed to go down. Uh, the melody was coming here, the melody was coming there. He's saying we're missing all of that, and that basically all that everybody is now singing is just songs that they hear on the radio and all of the other things and the stuff that's going on. And so the church has is, is kind of lost its relevance in society. It's no longer a place where we can come to find peace. It, it, and it's, it seems like it's always so busy. It, it's not a place where we, we really come. I, I hear people say this all the time. We were talking about it in Sunday school. It's a place where I come to find God. You don't find God in the church, okay? You bring God Amen. with you, okay? God doesn't leave here or stay here when y'all leave, okay? If he does, you got the wrong God, okay? There are other churches where their God is in the building. 
Ours is in the building when people are in the building. Because it's the building bringing God to a gathering. And this is who, where we are and, and where we come to, to understand when we're talking about coming into this place together. Letting you know that no matter who you are, you're important to this church. You may be the finger that we need. You may be the thumb, because without the thumb I can't grasp. You may be the eye, you may be the, the toe. You may be the ear, and hopefully some of y'all are the brains, okay? Because we need a few of those. Because the pastor sometimes has lost his. But collectively, and you hear the song, there's a song out that, will you be his hands and feet? And we are the hands and feet of Christ. We're the ones that's taking the message to the masses. We're the ones that's sharing Jesus with those outside these walls. So many times we think that when I just come here to share with everybody and catch up with everybody about how their week was. Now, I, I, I love you all and I love to catch up on what your week is going on and everything else, and that's great and that's wonderful. But after we catch up on what's going on, let's find out what's Jesus doing? What has he done in your life this week? Where, where have you been? Where has he led you? How, hey, what kind of a conversation did you have with somebody this week that God led you into that conversation? And, and begin to understand how things happen. Because sometimes as a, ch as a church, and I'm not talking Calvary, okay? I'm talking about the body of Christ. Sometimes we have done a lousy job of reflecting Jesus to people. There are sometimes you'll hear people say, if that's what it is to be a Christian, I don't have nothing to do with that. And yet we're telling people that we're Christ-like, and they're saying, really? Christ is like that? You know, I, Facebook is filled with it. I, I get this, uh, pray, pray for me because I'm going through a real hard time right now. And the next post is filled with all kinds of four-letter words. And they aren't here or were or it's all kinds of other little words that kids are reading because they're out there too but no matter what path has brought you here this morning I want you to know that we're honored that you're here it is it is a blessing to us because if you weren't here I'd be preaching to myself now that's not a bad sermon you know, but it's an honor to have all of you here and, and to show up. And we thank you. We really do thank you. But we're going to talk for a few weeks about together. And, and so um, many of you will remember these things growing up. Today, they're quite different than what they were in the very beginning. So I went out and I bought... 759 pieces of Legos. Okay? And I can take these 759 pieces of Legos, I can open these bags, and I could just throw them everywhere. And all you would have is 759 pieces of plastic. But yet, this company, a Danish company in 1936, started making these little things. And what happened was, all they did was, they had these ridges on them, right? And so what they would do is you could use your creativity to just start building something. 
But the only way that you could build it is you've got to put it together. And so you would, you would take and, you know, put these things in certain directions and, and all of this. And so, um, yeah, I've got to figure out where that goes. And then, you know, and so they, they got some that, that are like different shapes and everything. And so you can start building. If you go into, a, into the toy section of, of Walmart or whoever that sells Legos today, you'll find boxes of these things. And you look on there and there's all of these things. These parents hate these because in the middle of the night, you step on one of these things. It hurts. And your neighbors are calling the police. <laughs> because all they heard was, ah! And everybody in the house is awake by now. And of course, all of the kids are up there saying, remember that Lego that we lost? I think mom or dad just found it. <laughs> but you, you build these things. And, and, and this, when you start laying them all out and you design this and you put them all together, each piece fitting at a certain point in a certain place, what ends up coming out of that is an absolutely beautiful um, artistic thing that you have made. Well, may I say this to you, that this is what we're going to talk about, is this. Each one of you are a little piece of Lego that God takes and puts in a certain place and then he starts building around you and you around others so that by the time you get done completing this or he gets done completing this, it is the most beautiful, beautiful thing that you ever see because the master had his hands in it. Knowing exactly where everyone fit and how it was going to place that one here so it would be able to have someone else build on top of it and build on top of it. And so, but the only way that you could do that is this. If these pieces of Legos had a mind of their own and they decided I didn't want to go there, I want, I want to go over here on the edge, and, and, I, and I just want to just kind of hang on. Well, eventually, if I was to try and build more and more off the edge, off the edge, eventually what would happen is it would topple because it's leaning to one side and there's no support. This is where God is trying to bring the church and building it together. These little things that were made in 1936 by this Danish company. You know what? Today, they sell billions of dollars of Legos. Somebody just building just a little design with the ridges and the other place just fit, sitting right on top of it and it's working. I don't know if those were your favorite toys. They were some of mine. But when you really think about it, they're nothing but cheap pieces of plastic. Yeah. Cheap pieces of plastic. But yet, they make the most beautiful things. As a matter of fact, they've now got Legoland. I've never been there. Not sure I really want to go. But I might put it on my bucket list because I want to see what all of these things these people have made. That are, that are just almost like being the eighth, ninth, and tenth wonder of the world when you begin to see all of these things that they put together. But when you take these by themselves, they're nothing. But you start putting them all together, they create something. And that's what we as a church in the body of Christ, what God is trying to do. He's trying to put all of us together to create something. Not a conglomerated mess of disarray, okay? Contrary to popular belief, the church is not pop art. 
where you just take and throw the paint on the wall and see where it sticks. God doesn't work that way. I know some people really love that because they can use their imagination as to what they think it looks like, but I don't know about you. I think God knows what he wants us to look like as a church and as the body of Christ. I don't think he just picks us up and throws us up against the wall and splat wherever you land. We'll just put something else next to it and, and, and go, go from there. So when we learn all of these things, we're gonna, we're gonna hope that you all come back because the first thing that we're gonna start with today is we're gonna start about together in peace because there's a whole misunderstanding about peace and, and what it is. And so if you've got your Bibles, go with me to the book of Ephesians, if you would, please. And as you're getting there, we're actually going into, uh, if I can find my notes. It's back in the New Testament. Let me give you a couple of things about it. The, the city of Ephesus, if uh, you would go out and Google the word Ephesus, you may get like a city in, in uh, I think it's in Texas. Um, you get a, you get a, a something else and, and something else. And then eventually what you end up doing is finally getting to the city. And, and this city was a, a main port that everybody came through. And, and so it was, it was there. And so what you have in this port of Ephesus is a culture not of one group of people. You have a culture of all kinds of people that were there. And, and they start a church there. And you gotta understand something. This was not a church of Jews. Not just one group of Gentiles. This was people from all over. It, it was a place, a port, a place of commerce that everybody would come to. And, and so what would happen? It, it, it's like, it's like trying to bring somebody from Kentucky and putting them in New York. Whole different values. But yet you put the two together and they become friends. And then all of a sudden, the person in New York is beginning to learn the values of the person in Kentucky. And hopefully the person in Kentucky is not learning about the values of New York or California. They're beginning to learn something else. But you begin to form this melting pot. And, and, you, and you begin to start seeing what's going on. There are certain traits, you know. You get somebody that, that likes Hungarian food or somebody that likes German food. I don't really care for Indian food because they put too much curry in it. And I'm not a curry lover. Uh, no offense. <laughs> curry in my food. Curry is my brother. You're okay, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> Get me out of that one, God. <laughs> but, you know, there are certain ways, like, if you like your Mexican food. Now, me, I don't like hot sauce, okay? Jose just says, uh, give me a little bit of food with my hot sauce. You know, my, <laughs> my grandsons, we go to Skyline, they're putting, they're taking and, and drenching their, their crackers in hot sauce. And I'm thinking, y'all are nuts. <laughs> well, they said they learned that from their Paul. Because their Paul eats hot stuff. But there was some stuff that was too hot for you, wasn't there? Lone Star. Oh, Gold Star. Gold Star Habanero was... See, me, I'm chocolate. Chocolate and cinnamon, and I'm fine. You start spicing it up too much more than that, and, and, and it's, it's all over with. So, when we go into Ephesus, we begin to start seeing these things that are going on. So, if you've got your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 2, and verses 17 through 22 is where we're going to. Okay? Because right now, as you're listening to the news, they're trying to get peace between uh, Turkey and, and, and uh, Syria and the Kurds 
and, and this and that, and you're doing this and all of these other things, uh, Afghanistan and Iraq and Iran and the United States and uh, China and North Korea, and everybody's trying to broker peace. And you see what happens. They're still at war. And so here's what he says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 17 through the end of the chapter. He says, he came and proclaimed the good news of peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer foreigners or strangers, but rather fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as a cornerstone. In him, the whole building being put together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together for God's dwelling, he says, in the spirit. So when you begin to look at these, these things, we need to understand, so how do we get peace? The number one thing that you find in these verses is he talks about peace in unity. And a lot of people, when you start talking about that, you have a problem. How many of you all look for a place where you kind of fit in? And you kind of feel like you belong there, right? Have you ever gone to a place where you really feel like, I, I, I don't belong here? I don't fit in here? Um, I, you know, you, you've been in a, a place where the conversation's going on and, and the words that they're using are way above your head. And you're sitting there and you're trying to listen to the conversation because it seems interesting. But all of a sudden you realize, I don't understand a word they're saying. Or you ever go out, um, maybe when you were dating, and um, there were three of you. And it's like, one person seems left out because especially if it's a boy and two girls and the boy likes one of the girls and doesn't like the other, his whole attention, because men are, they're weird. Okay? Because men can't multitask. They, they, when, they see, when they see a girl, they focus on the one girl. You know, their, their eyes just... But then after a while, they're, oh, wow, I, where have you been? And it's like, I've been here the whole time, you know? Now, that was me with my wife. Her eyes were on all the boys. And whenever she dropped one, then she'd always come back to me, and I was the one that was always there. And if you see my pictures when I was little, you can't you can understand why she liked all the other boys than me. It was not a good sight. It was one of those faces that only your mom could love, <laughs> you know? Uh, they say that when you get older, you get better looking. Some of us do. Some of you all need some help, <laughs> you, you know? Maybe, I don't know, I've seen some of the pictures, but anyway. But when we start talking about the unity, okay, we understand that we're no longer foreigners and strangers. When you come into this building, into this church, into Calvary, you shouldn't be a stranger after a while. The first time in, we may not know much about you and you may not know much about us, but after a while, we should know each other. Now, will we know everything in depth? No. Because why? Because you, you learn, when you start developing friendships, you start developing a trust. And out of that trust, you begin to start letting people into your life. Knowing some things that maybe you haven't told anybody else. And that's okay. 
People say, well, no, 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 that we shouldn't have secrets among each other. Let me say this to you all. Jesus had 70 disciples. He went up on the mountain, he came back down. God said, pick out 12, and he did. Those were called his apostles. They were closer to him than the other 58. But then there were three, Peter, James, and John, that were closer than the other nine, or the other 67. And then there was one called John that was closer than all of the others. John never referenced in the writing to himself. He always said, the disciple that Jesus loved the disciple that Jesus loved. And so it's the same way in the church, but yet still we know each other. Those 70 knew each other, those 12 knew each other, those three knew each other, and they began to do these things. Did, let me ask you this question. Do you believe that all 12 of those disciples agreed with each other? I can tell you unequivocally, absolutely, no way. As a matter of fact, all 12 of them are walking down the road one day and Jesus is walking with them and three of them began a huge argument. Hey, when Jesus gets to his kingdom, there's a left side and a right side. And we are the sons of thunder. And we should get the rights to one on one side and one on the other. And Peter, being the outspoken one of the, of the bunch, says, I don't think so. I, may, I think maybe the conversation may have kind of gone like this. You want to fight over it? What makes you so special? I'm the one that's always speaking up. I should be the one getting the right side. Not you two squirts. You guys just sit here and don't say a word. I'm the one that's always out in the front making the statements and all of these things. Hey, Jesus. James and John says, hey, when we, or no, is hey, mom, can you go over there and talk to Jesus for us and ask him, will he give us a spot? Do you think they were unified? No. Peace and unity doesn't mean that we all agree. Peace and unity doesn't mean we all look alike, think alike. We all bring different things to the table. But when we start talking about a peace and unity, the peace that we get, ladies and gentlemen, is not from a feeling, it's not from a treaty. The peace that he's talking about is we all have God. That's our peace. When we look what Jesus said. Jesus said, I look to see where the Father is working and I go to join him. What each and every one of us are supposed to do is look to see where Jesus or where God is working in our life and work together with God in fulfilling that. And what God does is he brings all of these little pieces and starts putting them in the right spot in the right place of the puzzle, interlocking them together. So it, what it ends up doing is in, in order to do, to do something with this, you've got to start taking a piece out. And what happens is you've got to take, start taking pieces from the outside. It's very difficult to go in and just take one piece from the inside when it's surrounded by a whole lot of others. Or you've got to take a whole bunch of pieces at one time. And when he starts talking about peace and unity, what he's saying is the only way that you're going to break up this unity is when you start taking a whole piece or pieces. But it's going to be very difficult because what you've got to do is you've got to isolate the one piece, separate it by itself. And this is what Satan tries to do in your life, in churches, and all over the place. We need to all 
understand that we have all been offered the very same gift. The gift that was offered to you and you and you and you and you, all of you, is the same gift that was offered to me. It's called a gift of grace that God has extended to all, every, each and every one of us. And Paul begins to start saying to them, he says, listen, even though you're Jews and even though you're Gentiles, even though that you came from this part of the, of the Roman kingdom or this part of the Roman kingdom, it doesn't matter. Every one of you, no matter where you came from, no matter where you grew up, no matter what you've learned, he says, I, God has extended to you the same thing through his son, Jesus Christ, and that is grace. I'm not extending grace to one part of just the Jews and not to the Gentiles. I'm not extending it to this color or that color, just this one or just that one. That's why, you know, I, it, it, it beats, how do I say this? It irritates me when I hear these people that say, we're so much better than you. We're so much better than you. We're so much better than you. Or, or you get some religions that think, you know, uh, somebody, I, I think I, I told you I grew up uh, being taught that Baptist was the only ones that was going to heaven because John was a Baptist. And after a while, when you start getting learning and you can read the Bible for yourself and <laughs> see what is there, you understand, no, he wasn't. He was a baptizer. Change the word. Don't, don't make it a, a religion or, or a denomination or whatever. And, and you hear people all the time that will tell you, you, you know, that unless um, it's, it's a old time fashion, old fashioned Baptist, there's few of them still around. And they believe they're the only church going to heaven because they're, they're abiding by all these rules and all these other things. And you'll get some people say the Catholics or the Pentecostal or this or that or whatever. No, the grace of God has been extended to each and every one of us. And it's not dependent upon a church name or a religion. The grace of God has been extended to each and every one of us to let us understand that Jesus Christ died for each and every one of us. It doesn't matter. And this is what he was trying to understand this. So I get a peace in unity. I also get a peace in God's presence. What, what happens is when, the, when, I don't know about you all, but have you ever been a place in your life where it just seems like the whole world is just caving in on you, and then all of a sudden, it's just like, it, it's almost like the peace of dove of God just comes down and surrounds you. And it's almost like what happened here? A few minutes ago, I was all knotted up on the inside, and a few minutes ago, it just seemed like my heart was racing, and I, I, was, I was feeling the anxiety, and I was feeling all of the stuff that was just collapsing around me. And then all of a sudden, God, I just feel your peace. Some of you have had that because you've gone to the doctor and you've gotten a bad prognosis or diagnosis. And they just look at you like, okay, respond. And it's like, what do you want me to say? I serve a God that's in control. He knows what he's doing. If it's to take me, that's okay. If it's to leave me here, that's okay too. But I'm okay with this. Because the peace of God that he has given to all of us is, is what we begin to understand. And, and Paul, in Galatians uh, 5.22, tells us that this peace isn't something that we create in ourselves. This is the Eastern myth, mystics that want to tell you that the way you get peace is you sit there with your legs crossed and you hum, you know, or whatever. 
You, you know, you, you've got to get acquainted and, and, and you've got to connect with yourself. I don't know about y'all, but it seems like I am more disconnected than ever before. It's like a, your, your right hand wants to do something and your left hand wants to do something and your right eye wants to look at this while your left eye is looking at this and your whole body's just going around in all kinds of circles and, and, and you've got one pain one w w place and, and as soon as that pain goes away, you get another one. And sometimes you get the pains in two places or five places and it seems like, okay, what I'm trying to find is a place on my body that doesn't hurt. As you get older, some of you know that. For those of you that are young, don't worry, you'll get there. But you, you're looking for that peace. And, we're, and what happens is everybody tries to tell you, you you've got to be at peace with yourself, peace with yourself, peace with yourself. No, I got to be at peace with God. That's who I got to be at peace with. And when, I, when I'm at peace with God, it is He is the one that's given me the peace inside. If I am not at peace with God, let me tell you all something. You can do whatever you want to do. You will never be at peace with yourself. It won't happen. Because you're going to do something stupid. And you're going to ask yourself, why did I do that? May I say this, that every once in a while, even when you do have God, you do stupid things. Okay? But we need to understand something, and that is this. You need to understand, I need to understand, we are not alone. God did not put us here to be hermits. I, you know, I, I hear this from people all of the time. And I share this, hold on. I'm not going to church because I don't need church. I can worship God wherever I want to, wherever. I, yes, I can bring my personal worship to God anywhere. But what I can't bring is my corporate worship. I can't do my corporate worship in the woods by myself. God wants corporate worship. He wants us all together. And, and, and what do we bring to the, uh, the corporate worship? It's awesome. We started the first song off. Jonathan and his wife were coming in. And Jonathan is dancing down the aisle. And I'm watching this, I mean, cool, that's, that's it. And, I, and I'm watching um, Rick and Tammy's little girl. He's got her in the back door. She's in the back door. She's dancing all over the place, clapping to her hands. I'm watching Emily back in the back over here. I'm watching Melissa over here. People are just, you know, they're bringing all kinds of stuff. It's hard to do that by yourself. You can do it by yourself. And sometimes, let me say this, by yourself, you have less inhibitions. You can act crazy, you know? But when you come into corporate worship, I gotta make sure that I clap at the right time and be in rhythm with everybody. I don't care. Number one, you need to understand, Baptists don't have, relig they don't have rhythm, okay? Most Baptists, get sidetracked. And, and, and so it's hard for them to clap in rhythm. That's why we need more people with rhythm and, and letting them clap. That's why I don't clap, okay? Because I clap and I pat and I, I just, you know, it's just whatever you feel. And the problem is I don't want people watching me and doing what I'm doing, okay? Because then you really be messed up. Because I rewrite songs, I sing what I feel, you know, ask anybody that's up here singing with me. They're trying to stay with the words, and, I, and I'm somewhere, someplace else, you know, doing my own thing, but it's, it's, it's not there. So where is the presence of God? It's in, his, it's in his people. So when we start talking about this peace, that he talks about a way of peace. And what that is, it's all, all of us being built together, okay? Not separately. Paul closes Ephesians chapter 2 with this. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling place in which God lives by the Spirit. And we talked about the Legos, and we've got to go back to the Legos. And that is this. You take every one of those things and you start putting them together and you start building something. 
God has every one of you as a piece of Lego trying to put you together. And so many times we forget the things that we need to understand. So why do we come back to church? Let me ask you this question. Why did you come here this morning? What was it for? And the next question was, who did you invite to come with you? There are people that are outside these doors that are waiting for somebody to invite them. There's a lot of lonely people that are sitting outside right now looking for someone just to talk to. This world today, ladies and gentlemen, is suffering more anxiety and depression than ever before. You know what the number one killer of teenagers today is? Suicide. And you know what's happening? It's moving down. Not just in the, teen, or in the teens. It's, it's moving down into... You pick up the newspaper and you see a five or a six-year-old that killed themselves because they were being bullied in school. Somebody was being, making fun of them. Those kids wanted to fit in. And they didn't look like everybody else. And that's okay. Because none of us are identical twins. And may I say this to y'all? God doesn't make identical twins in Christianity. Each one of us are separate. Each one of us are different. There's some characteristic about us that nobody else has at that moment and at that time. And so what we need to understand is the church is like Legos. It's people in different sizes and shapes and some are curved and some are this or some are that, but all fitting together to make something beautiful that God has said, here's my, here's my bride of my son Jesus that, that's doing these things. So I don't know about you, but as we begin to understand First of all, there's peace in unity. And unity says, I, I'm not the same shape, I'm not the same color, I'm not the same this, I'm not the same that, but put us all together and you ain't ripping us apart. I don't care if the color of the carpels is, carpet is red, pink, blue, orange, or multicolored. I didn't come here to serve because of a, a color of a carpet, okay? You hear people want to go to church because it looks good, aesthetics or whatever. That's great, it looks good. But that isn't what serves. What happens if it burns down tomorrow? What do you do? If that's, if that's where you're tied to as a building, and what happens if that building gets collapsed? And, well, that's what brought us all together, was the building. Then we've lost something. It isn't the building that brings people together. It's the people being brought together by the unity of understanding that we all have peace with God internally that also will, will exude out into other people around us. So that those people outside these walls says, yes, that is what a Christian is supposed to be. This morning, my question to you is, where are you at? How can you have peace and unity with each other until you get peace and unity with God? And right now, if you don't have it, we're going to get a song of an invitation, and we're going to give you an opportunity to find it. You say, Pastor, I've never had that, okay? Let me say this to you. God says this. He says, if I don't know you, 
which is through my son, Jesus Christ. I don't have a relationship with you. You are my enemy. Therefore, you are not at peace with God. You're fighting constantly because he's wanting you to do something and Satan is telling you, no, don't do that. You don't, you don't have to do that. You, you, don't, you, you don't have to ask Jesus to come into your life. You, because listen, as soon as, as soon as you ask Jesus to come into your life, what's gonna happen is everybody's gonna want you to be just like a Christian that's been there for 50 years. You're gonna have to stop all of this and all of that, and you can't do this anymore. You're gonna have to go to church seven days a week, 24 hours a day. You're gonna to have to pick your Bible up and, and, and not just carry it with you. You're gonna to have to be reciting it. Everywhere you go, when, some, when somebody talks to you, you give them a Bible verse. When they ask you how the weather is, you're going to tell them that God made the trees and the sun and the moon and all these things. They're going to ask you, how's your kids? And you're going to have to tell them, give them a Bible verse that says your children are, are arrows in your quiver, you know, or, or a pain in your backside. You, you know, you're going to, I just got to have a Bible verse for everything. I can't carry on a simple conversation without throwing in a, a, a Bible verse. That's what they're going to expect of you to do. And, and you're going to have to get up, you're going to have to get up at nine o'clock and well, hopefully before nine o'clock in order to get here by 930 for, for Sunday school. And, and you know, man, I got other things to do. You, you know, I got like sleep. You know, I, I need that. And so I can't do this. I can't do that. And there's all these restrictions they're going to tell you. You know, you got to do this. You got to do that. that. That's not it. What it's all about is coming to come into a relationship with God and allowing God to mold you and make you into what he wants you to be, not what everybody else wants you to be. Because at the end of the day, you're not standing before everybody else and being judged, you're standing before Him. That is the beginning of the relationship. And from there, it moves. And the more you learn about Him, the more you want to get to know Him. And the more you get to know Him, the more you want to know more about Him. And the more about Him, and the more about Him. And the more you find out about Him, it is awesome to understand He is not what everybody told me He was. I have found the qualities of God that nobody ever told me he had. As we go deeper and deeper into that relationship that we find, my question to you is, are you ready for that relationship and that peace that he's trying to give you? Let's stand, would you? Hello, this is Pastor Chuck Cotton from Calvary Baptist Church. First of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for taking the time out to either listen to our sermon or to watch it on video. We are grateful that you've actually taken the time and hope and pray that it has been a blessing to you as it was to us as we delivered it to our congregation. We ask if you have any questions whatsoever that you email us at Pastor Chuck at CalvaryBaptistMiddletown.org or you could come in and give us a phone call, if you would please, at area code 513-423-7251. I'd like to take this opportunity to also invite you to come to our church and visit us, if you would please. We actually have small groups on Sunday morning starting at 9.30 with our morning worship. Prior to our morning um, small groups, we also provide donuts with coffee, um, milk, orange juice, a time for fellowship, get to know each other, have a good time before we actually break out into our small groups for Sunday. Our worship services are uplifting, they're fast moving, and everything in our service is just a fast pace. But we do take time every once in a while to slow down as we feel the Holy Spirit moving, and we never want to hinder it in any way. We also have on Sunday evening, during the school year, we have Awana, and Awana starts with the Puggles, actually from age two all the way up through high school. And during that period of time, we also have a worship service. Both of these start at six o'clock and end at 7.30. Our Wednesday night, we have a Bible study, which starts at seven, we generally finish about 8.15. We would love for you to come and visit with us. Don't have to dress up, just come as you are, because to us, it doesn't matter. You're, you're a child of God, a creation of His, and so to us, you're important to everything that we do. Our motto here is building the kingdom one life at a time, and we hope that we have a chance to visit with you, get to know you as you get to know us. So thank you, and may God bless you.